Good evening. My name is Rachel Foss and I'm Head of Contemporary Archives and Manuscripts at the British Library. It's my pleasure to welcome you here for this evening's event, Shirley Williams, A Life in Politics. A very special welcome too to our online audience. It's really wonderful to have you with us. Just a, a quick heads up to let those of you joining us online know that you're able to put your questions in the questions box on your screens, as we'll be coming to questions later on in the event, so you can be thinking of anything that you want to ask now. The library has recently announced its acquisition of the Shirley Williams Archive, and as well as celebrating the life of one of the most well-known and unusually popular politicians of recent times, we're also marking this acquisition tonight. It's a real privilege for the library to have been able to offer a permanent home for this wonderful collection. I should like to take this opportunity to record my thanks to Rebecca Williams and her family for their generosity in donating the archive, in which I know they were following Shirley Williams' express wishes, and for their support and friendship during that process and beyond. In capturing the life of a profoundly morally committed, energetic and prolific public servant, the archive, through Shirley Williams' remarkable career, chronicles many of the significant shifts in the social and political landscape of post-war Britain. <coughs> it's been fascinating to see in the archive how many themes and subjects which Shirley Williams influenced are live and current with us right now. The cost of living crisis, the role of Britain in Europe, the position of women in political life, to name just a few. We have a free display currently showing in the library's treasures gallery, which showcases numerous highlights from the archive. The treasures gallery is in the library's main building, just over the piazza, and the display runs until the 25th of February next year, so you have plenty of time to see it, and I would encourage you to do so if you get the chance. We're currently working to make the archive available to the public, Work to catalogue it will begin next year, and we expect it to be available for researchers in the summer of 2025. We're extremely grateful to the British Library Collections Trust for their support in making this work possible. I'd like also to welcome and to thank our distinguished panel of speakers this evening. We're delighted to have as our chair, Rachel Corp, Chief Executive of ITN, who oversees one of the largest independent television production companies in the UK. Prior to taking on this role, Rachel was editor of ITV News, under whose leadership the team won multiple Royal Television Society Journalism Awards. Rachel began her ITN career as a trainee and also spent time in Russia as the BBC's senior Moscow producer. <coughs> she is also a UK board trustee at Women for Women International. So I think we're in for a fascinating evening, and without further ado, I'll hand over to Rachel. Thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to put a bit more light on. I've got that old person's thing of doing this. So look, um, thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me uh, for this conversation tonight, which I hope will provide some really illuminating insight into the extraordinary life and legacy of Shirley Williams, MP. Now, reading about her and uh, seeing the archive here at the British Library, it, it's clear that from the beginning, she was determined to do things differently as a journalist, as a politician, and an academic. She started out as a woman reporter in the then very male world of the Financial Times. She was one of the first women MPs. She played leading roles in three political parties and both chambers of parliament. One of the first women to sit in cabinet, driving through the completion of the comprehensive school system, famously breaking away from Labour with the Gang of Four to create the SDP, becoming its first elected MP, and continuing to campaign throughout her life for issues she cared most about, from international relations to nuclear non-proliferation. Trailblazer is a word not always used appropriately, but it seems to have been made for Shirley Williams. For me, growing up in the 70s and 80s, she was really the first politician who cut through as something more than just an MP, a distant MP. There was something human there, a real person, both inspiring and relatable. And her attempts to reshape 
Britain's modern history and the impact of that really continues to be felt today, I think. She was a pioneering woman and I'm really looking forward to hearing much more about her and really what this amazing archive will reveal from our brilliant panel this evening. Just a little bit about ITN. Uh, we really feel we've got the privilege of playing a vital role in, in the fabric of the UK's public service broadcasting system. We make the news for ITV, Channel 4 and Channel 5 and really care about delivering trusted and impartial journalism with eyewitness reporting and people's stories very much at the heart of our coverage. We also like to stir things up a little. It was ITN who made Barbara Mandel the UK's first female newsreader in 1955. And more recently, we're really proud to have a long line of female editors of our different news services and now female CEOs too. I am number three in a row. On screen, as you mentioned, we firmly believe in holding those in power to account, whether through our exclusive party gate revelations or as the only TV crew who went in with the crowds storming the Capitol in Washington a couple of years ago. And the impact of those reports continues to widely influence both journalism and political discourse. I hope Shirley would approve in some way. So we said, we'll be discussing her life and her character, her impact on politics as a woman as well, and whether women talk about their role in the political world in the same way today, and really how this archive arrived at the British Library and any gems that have been found within it. I'd like to introduce Rebecca as the daughter of Shirley Williams, Rebecca Williams. Has, she spent most of her career in, as a government lawyer in the civil service, and she's really played a key role in organising the archive and ensuring it was deposited according to her mother's wishes. Her help's been vital to really sift through it and, and really increase our understanding of, of some of the amazing items in there. Helena Kennedy is one of Britain's most distinguished lawyers. I feel like you don't need introduction, but uh, she spent her professional life giving voice to those who have the least power within our system, championing civil liberties and promoting human rights, and has used many public platforms, including the House of Lords, which she was elevated to in 97, uh, to, to bring her passion, wit and humanity to argue for social justice, and has written and broadcast on many, many issues. Mark Bostrich is an award-winning author whose books include biographies of Shirley's mother, Vera Britton, and of Florence Nightingale. He's got loads more that he was far too modest, modest for me to read out. But the Florence Nightingale was awarded the Elizabeth Longford Prize for Historical Biography, and he has a new book, In Pursuit of Love, which is published by Bloomsbury next summer. Now, obviously, three incredible people with a lot of knowledge, but what I think is really wonderful is um, that you all knew her so well. And I really wanted to kick off, because um, really feeling her presence here, just, just a, a, little, a little bit about her, her as, as the mother, as, as the friend, as the, as the someone you worked with. Start with Rebecca. Well, I think <coughs> as, a, as an opening anecdote, um, I mean, I remember my mother as, as being immensely kind and generous, which I think perhaps um, separated her out from, from some people who were very successful. Um, she loved people. She um, was on first name terms with people the minute she met them, really, and everyone felt they could treat her the same way. Um, she didn't believe in, in, in class or, or division, really, in that way. Her, one of her overriding principles was, was equality. Um, and I think perhaps it's fair to say that unlike some modern politicians, she really did live according to her principles, um, always. Thank you, I'm sure that's a theme we're gonna be coming back to. Um, Mark, because you worked for her, with her, and a friend as well. Yeah, I, I first met her when I was 18, I was still at school, and a friend of mine at school was Shirley's nephew, and he invited me to come along and meet Shirley. I had no idea who Shirley was, though she was Education Secretary at the time. I remember the drive in the, in the ministerial car, Shirley had a female driver. And I also remember that Shirley spent much of the evening trying to convince me not to go up to my interview at Oxford. Um, <laughs> and coming from the education secretary, this is a bit of a weird thing. Um, but I'd like to reiterate what, Shirley, what Rebecca said, because I found a quote from her mother, which I think her mother wrote when Shirley was about 20, when she said that Shirley was gold in all the fundamentals. And it's true that Shirley was immensely kind, thoughtful, um, never enthralled to or impressed by anybody because of the money they had, the power they had. I mean, she was, was truly remarkable in that sense. The other thing I remember when I first knew her, I briefly worked for her in the mid-80s before I 
um, got embroiled in writing Vera Britton's biography, is her, the power of her oratory. I mean, it, literally in the 80s, it just took my breath away that somebody could stand up without any notes and put their arguments across so clearly. The other thing was, if you went to her and said, oh, I've got this sort of argument and it's sort of half formed and uh, I don't really know how to put it, she would look at you, listen to what you had to say, and then a couple of minutes later, <coughs> return it to you in perfect English, wholly sort of assured fashion. And that, of course, is something that we've completely lost, in, I think, in our politics today, mm -hmm. that ability to win people over by argument and by oratory. Thank you. It feels like we're probably turning to AI these days, which is you know, <laughs> not a substitute. Helena. Well, Shirley and I were very close friends. We became close friends, um, although we were of different generations, but I loved her. Um, she was, um, I got to know her really, I mean, she was, of course, in my life in that she was, uh, you know, she was one of those people that one saw on the television and we thought that she was wonderful. And, and um, I come from an, a family who are Catholics in Glasgow. And so they loved the fact that this woman was a Catholic politician. And so, uh, so I grew up um, knowing about Shirley Williams. And then, of course, uh, she entered my life. And uh, um, I got to know her really Back, I would have said, we were, Rebecca and I were trying to remember, but I think it was probably in the, in the late 80s and um, I was already sort of campaigning around a number of things, uh, particularly women in the law, and, uh, and would sometimes share a platform with her. Um, but then, um, during the early 90s, I was uh, the chair of Charter 88. Now, some of you may remember what Charter 88 was, um, but some of you will not. But Charter 88 was an organisation was set up in 1988, and it was really in, in a sort of in response to Thatcherism. And it was, it was to say that there was something wrong with our constitution. It wasn't working very well, and we wanted to see lots of reform. Uh, I wanted to see a written constitution, a Bill of Rights, devolution, a Freedom of Information Act, um, uh, um, you know, a House of Lords reformed, all of that. And, um, and I, I remember Shirley and I having wonderful conversations about this because she was a serious intellectual. But she was also funny and good company and, uh, and uh, just a joy to be with. And um, the, the forging of the closeness I had with Shirley was over the fact that she married Dick and came to Cape Cod. And for bizarre reasons um, in my own life, um, I had been mentored by a famous American civil liberties lawyer um, when I was young as a lawyer. And I used to go on holiday with him and his wife and then um, ended up going to Cape Cod with them. And then when I married and had children, Ian and I would go and have these holidays. And uh, Shirley married Dick Newstadt. They, he had a house there in Cape Cod. And so every summer, we spent our summers together. And this is the, the Shirley that you all don't know, the Shirley who used to kayak and used to swim and used to swim in ponds with my husband and actually was the strongest swimmer almost as he was and who was just so athletic your mother was incredibly um, and sort of was prepared to try anything and uh, and so we used to spend time together in, in the summers and uh, we were lucky on occasions when Rebecca was there with her with her little ones and I have to tell you that I have the privilege of being the godmother of one of those little ones of Rebecca not so, so little I, now not, <laughs> no he's a man now you know but it, that it's uh, it uh, so I feel connected to the family in a very deep way but Shirley and I were were allies and when I went into the House of Lords I mean, she really was a mentor to me she also saw me through some hard times because of course I had my battles um, on law with new labor over the de detention without trial over the Iraq war over things where she you know and I were in agreement and she and, and I have notes from her, which I'll have to put into the archive, you know, where she would say, I know how painful this is for you because I've been there. And she was a great friend. That's lovely. Thank you. And, and fantastic way to start because there's the Shirley, the, the public Shirley, that I guess we all know to a degree, but there's very much the, the other side. And, and that's what's lovely about this archive because it has all aspects of her life. So just to go to back to the beginning, do you want to talk us through how the archive came to the British Library? So as you mentioned already, um, Rachel and the other Rachel mentioned, um, I knew that my mother wanted to give her papers to, to the British Library. She made that clear to me. She wanted them to be publicly accessible and um, she felt there would be useful information there. Um, the 
problem was that I had no idea what these papers exactly consisted of. Uh, my mother was not a materialistic person at all. She had no interest really in, in objects or soft furnishings or, or clothes, or which clothes. the <laughs> popular press did comment on in her when she first became a member of parliament. Um, she just thought life was really too short to worry about mm -hmm. those sorts of things. And her main interest really was books and writing, not perhaps surprising, her mother had been a writer. She'd grown up in a very academic household. Her father was an academic. She married two academics. Um, and that was what she really related to. So she had two flats. She had a small flat in London. She had a bigger flat in Hertfordshire, which is next door to where I currently live. And both those flats were absolutely full of paper, newspapers, books. Cuttings, um, cuttings. Cuttings. <laughs> half written articles, um, drafts of speeches. So I knew there was quite a lot of material. I um, didn't know how much of it would really be relevant. I think somewhat to our surprise, we found that at the time of my mother's death, there was a huge amount more material than I had ever imagined. And this was because she had boxes and boxes of material full of things that she had obviously never thrown away. I had no idea she was a hoarder. I was going to ask that. this. Was, was it literally loads and loads of boxes? That loads. I mean, deep, start? deep cupboards. She had the, her flat in Hertfordshire is a, a, a Victorian building with huge, deep, Cupboards. I remember at the time she bought it, she said, oh, this will be very useful. It has a lot of storage. I don't think I realised quite what a worrying thing that was for her to say, but <laughs> they were stuffed to the gills. And I had no idea that she had kept all this stuff. And not in any particular order. This was the challenge, really. Um, so, for example, you would pull out a box and open it, and there would be loads and loads of newspapers from, you know, the 1980s. And you think, well, this is moderately interesting, but not something the British Library is going to want. They have those. Um, and so we can just throw those away. But you went halfway through the box, and then you might find something completely unexpected. So, for example, I found... Uh, the scroll at the time of her accession to the House of Lords. You'll be familiar with how mm -hmm. elaborate that is, Helena. Yeah. And it was there, and she'd obviously never done anything with it, stuck it in a box, and thought, I better keep that. And <laughs> well, that never seen the light of day. Letter, letters patent, as they call it. Precisely, <laughs> and all terribly fancy. Um, and but then that it didn't have any special places in amongst the. In no, the just the literally in the middle of a box. And then you'd go a bit further down, and there'd be some other gem, like uh, at, in the exhibition, there's her, her membership card for the Labour Party, which she joined at si when she was 16, um, and uh, membership of the Fabian Society and so on. And all of this was just scattered among the various um, newspapers. Uh, one thing I remember was I pulled out a very dusty old box and found that it was a very, actually, for my mother, surprisingly meticulous collection of all of the Oxford student magazine, Isis, for the whole time she'd been at Oxford, every single one for three years, in the middle of which was one with her on the cover as the Isis idol, a sort of form of early pin-up. So, you know, that was something she had mentioned to me that this, this had actually... Had actually, she'd actually made the cover. I'd never seen it. It was a rather glamorous pic, actually, <laughs> of her looking rather theatrical. So that was interesting. Um, but all sorts of things like this. We had to go through every box in great detail. There was also a lot of material, actually, which had obviously belonged to her mother and related to her mother's life. And I was surprised to find as much of that as I did. And I think um, I invited Mark, who's a great friend of mine, down to, to look at, at that. And he was able to identify a lot more of the rather stern... Victorian and Edwardian photographs of ancestors than I was um, because he obviously knows a lot about the family. Um, and in fact, a lot of that material went to Somerville College because um, they hold material relating to my grandmother's life. Um, but as I say, I, I, I was genuinely surprised by, by the amount of material there. So uh, my family and I did a preliminary sort of, of what we thought might be interesting to, to the British Library. We ended up with something like 35 or 40 boxes of material. Wow. It was absolutely huge. Um, Rachel, who have just heard from, came down and was very helpful to us. She came down on several occasions, assisted us with the preliminary sorting and working out what could be moved to, to the British Library. And I think ended up with something like 35 boxes of material, which is here and remains, obviously, to be catalogued and, 
and become accessible. And uh, do you get a sense of what proportion of that is the more the public side, what, what proportion is the personal side, or is it, is it sort of all of it in together? I think that's a good question. I think all of it is in together. Um, given the volume of material, I, I was able to identify the sort of genre of material, but I certainly wasn't able to go through every document and and know exactly what's there. There was a lot of correspondence, personal correspondence. That surprised me because um, a lot of it dated back to even the 1940s and 50s, letters to her mother, which her mother had obviously kept. Um, so a lot of those came to light, which surprised me because a lot of my grandmother's archive was actually sent to, to Canada, uh, material relating to her life. So there's actually a lot more here than I'd realised. Um, so there was, there was correspondence and... Um, and a lot of notes. I mean, she obviously wrote, as Mark has said, I think my mother largely spoke spontaneously and without notes. And in fact, sometimes, you know, we would, I would drive her to a meeting and she would say when, when she was older and, and you know, she, she would not necessarily have remembered everything she wanted to bring. And she'd say, oh, my goodness, I've forgotten my notes. And I said, well, it, you know, it doesn't matter because you never use your notes anyway. So, I mean, that was... <coughs> but she did actually take quite meticulous notes, which I suspect she didn't use, but a lot of those are there and have been kept. Yes. So probably accidentally more than anything else. But and, and lovely to see her handwriting as well. And time. everything was written. I mean, she did yep. attempt to use computers and word processors and she thought that was the thing to do, but it did not come naturally to her. We had a lot of sessions with the computer every weekend <laughs> about how to master email and I feel we were reinventing the wheel rather a lot. But uh, uh, yes, I mean, when she was, she was doing her work, she would write everything longhand and that's, that's how it was. Lovely. Thank you. We'll come back to more of it. Um, Mark, we, obviously we were referring back to um, Shirley's mother there. Can you, can you give us more of an insight, I suppose, into her, her life, her, her personality, right. what, what shaped her politics? Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to say something about the archive because um, I felt very sorry for Rebecca because she was landed with this terrible task and we came in periodically to help her and it was like excavating Schliemann's Troy in that it was sort of layers and yes. you knew if you went down and threw, we threw an awful lot away, mm. but then you'd find a really significant letter. There's a really horrid letter from Margaret Thatcher um, <laughs> when Shirley... Um, horrid in what way? Well, <laughs> Shirley Reveal. lost... The, um, well, uh, the story of Shirley and Thatcher needs to be written, but anyway, <laughs> there was a horrible letter from Thatcher because Shirley had evidently written to Thatcher in 1983 correcting something that, Shirley had, uh, that Thatcher had said in the Commons about Shirley losing Crosby in the general election and Shirley wanted to point out that she had um, she'd lost the seat largely because of boundary changes and Thatcher was very sort of uh, ungracious and sort of gave in and said yes that's right but in a re really horrible cold tone anyway um, there were if you looked at the if you look at the archive the interesting thing is it goes right back to Shirley's early life to, to her um, when she was about five or six. And you see her seductive power over people from a very early age. <laughs> so there are letters from Herbert Morrison, the Labour Home Secretary oh, during the Second World War. Relationship with she him. had a great you know, He, he yeah, met her in an air raid, air raid shelter, shelter in him, 1942, yes. and he was totally entranced by her. I think um, she, she addressed him and wouldn't let him get a word She wouldn't in address him, and he used yes. to invite her to, to lunch subsequently, and gradually he, he tried to play too much of a part in guiding her career, and she sort of gently pushed him away. Victor Galantz was another one. And then you get all the men that were in love with her at Oxford. So you have the letters of Peter yes, Parker yes. and Roger Bannister. Roger Bannister Roger sprinted Bannister, yeah. um, to, to, to see Shirley's she train off when she went to Columbia. Um, <laughs> anyway, the, the thing about Shirley's um, upbringing and, and the influences on her, I think one of the most remarkable things, and, and remarkable that she didn't sort of uh, fall under the pressure of it all, was that she was, in essence, the fulfilment of other people's dreams. Her mother um, was a feminist, and Shirley, from an early age, was intended to fulfil a role that women of her mother's generation hadn't managed to do um, so far. And so when Shirley um, entered Parliament, it was an extraordinary um, achievement um, in, in her mother's eyes for her mother's sort of particular form of, of upbringing and then of course her father had always who was an academic a political scientist had always wanted to be uh, an MP and had never managed to, to be one yeah. and one of Shirley's earliest experiences which she claimed to remember but I somehow doubt it was being pushed around in 1931 when she was a year old the streets of Brentford at Chiswick when her father attempted to get into parliament and of course he, he was unsuccessful but in another, in another way 
Um, the, person, the people who Shirley resembled much more were her father's family. Her father's father, the Reverend Catlin, who was a con congregational minister who later became a, a Church of England cleric, who was full of moral didactic di didacticism and aggression. And actually, Shirley was rather like that. She would <laughs> slightly preach at you morally sometimes if she didn't think you were following the right path. The other person was her grandmother, her mother's, I'm sorry, her father's mother, Edith Kate. Edith, yeah. Um, Edith Kate Catlin, who married this Church of England minister. She, he, she was 16 years younger than him. And then she developed suffragist. She was a non-militant. She was a very keen non-militant. Um, she developed these suffragist views. And as a result, her marriage broke up. Quite and difficult, she, I think, to be a vicar's wife. With to be a views. vicar's wife. And, and, and uh, in fact, he then lost his living, I understand. He lost his living. And, and when I went to, to Kew Vicarage in, in the 80s, there were still people who somehow remembered the, the rows that had gone on between them. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so Edith Kate Catlin, after Shirley's death, we looked into her career a bit more and found that she really was very serious. She'd taken part in the women's coronation pr procession of 19, um, 1911, um, women were excluded from uh, from um, coronation procession, the normal coronation processions, and she was a, a very a serious suffragist, um, and also the subject of one of Vera's more pon ponderous, Vera Britton's more ponderous novels, *Honourable Estate*. So it always seems extraordinary to me that Shelley grew up with this these expectations on her, and she, she managed not to sort of go under um, dealing with them. I mean, I think part of the thing was she went to America. She was evacuated to America when she was um, 11, um, 10. Um, and so she had that kind of liberation. Um, I think that made her very self-reliant, actually, and yes, very independent. Very independent. So she had quite a difficult a time age. with her parents when she came back. But um, So you can see this shaping her as a person. How much did it shape her politics as well, do you think? Well. People talk about her privileged background, and she was obviously brought up in, in a household where money was not a problem. Though her mother was the bre breadwinner, her father never earned any money and, and always spent rather a lot. Um, so there, there was that. Um, but Shirley rebelled about, against that sort of bourgeois sort of upbringing. Um, she was quite tiresome into her teenage years. She was always lecturing her family about spending too much and you know, the poor were the real, really virtuous. And when she was three years old, she was sent to Mrs. Brechin's private school in South Kensington. And after a term there, announced um, that she wanted to go to a school where there weren't so many rich children. And <laughs> so she was sent to Christchurch Elementary School. Um, I think her father's influence was much more profound um, in, her, in her early years. Um, I mean, her Catholicism... Uh, she converted to Catholicism, as had her father. Um, she also converted to Catholicism because of her closeness to the Burnetts, um, the, the family, family yeah, people, who, the, who, people the housekeeper, and and um, and also she never was a pacifist. Um, she espoused her father's view of a Aquinas' view of of the, of the just war, and that was. But she nevertheless, um, for instance, went to stay during the Second World War. Um, at uh, one of the um, peace communities in Essex. So th um, there was a sort of streak of radicalism. It, it, she, 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 she saw that, that radical side of things. Um, and in, in much into later life, some of her closest friends were people who'd been conscientious objectors during the Second World War, who, who, who she'd met at, at the peace community. I think some of that was the influence of her mother, although, as you say, she was closer to her mother in adult life than as a child. But I think those radical principles, although, yeah. as you say, she wasn't a pacifist, in a way, she imbibed at some level. She um, admired her mother's integrity. She admired and, her mother's integrity. Yes. Yeah, but, I mean, from, from, uh, from our writings and from the things that she said about her mother and talking about her childhood, um, she felt her mother... Was distance. It was her father that she would mm. always said that she felt cl closer to when she was a child. I think her, f her father was a warmer person mm. in terms of his personality. I think her mother was very scarred by the water. Her credit, I think that's mm. something that she recognised and, mm. and tried to understand in later life. Um, but her, her, her mother saw her 
life as a sort of mission to, mm. to write about what had happened to her to mm. try and forward pacifism and be involved in the League of Nations and so on. And I think that that Shirley, and as she said in her own autobiography, Climbing the Bookshelf, she said, you know, I, I learnt from my mother that, you know, her work was first, my brother was second, and I was third. And that was how she saw it. And I think as an adult, her mother came to understand that she had extraordinary gifts and they became much closer, but I think it did take quite a long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they were very different. I mean, I remember my grandmother as a much older woman, um, mm. but she was, she was quite formal and slightly distant in a way that wouldn't really be easily recognised today, and Shirley wasn't like that, as, as you've mm. alluded to. She was very accessible. Warm and, very yeah. accessible, yeah. Thank you. So just thinking about um, her political career, I don't really think to call it career, it's her life really, and, and obviously she, she played such a role in party politics for so many decades, way longer than a lot of people. She's been called everything, Ed Davey calls her a liberal lion, she's had every accolade going. How do we even begin to look at her political legacy and, and the impact she's had, do you think? Well, Rebecca knows that I feel this, that when, when um, uh, Shirley died and there was a very big funeral at um, Westminster Cathedral, well, um, actually, that was the memorial service. Well, I mean, was the because memorial the funeral, service. Well, the funeral owing was to COVID, COVID had to be absolutely minute. No, that was minute. Uh, that was, then, was... then there was this, this great sort of thing, and the cardinal spoke and all that sort of thing. And, it, and I felt it just didn't capture the spirit of my friend. Um, and uh, and the, the fact, I mean, uh, feminism was barely mentioned and her commitment to um, uh, women's equality. I mean, Shirley actually did say things like, you know, um, I, I don't believe just in tar targets. I think if we want to have more women in parliament, we're going to have to actually, um, you know, do something proactive and uh, we should be thinking about having, you know, uh, uh, quotas. I mean, Shirley had very radical <laughs> views about things. Um, where she was not radical, of course, and where she and I used to have great discussions, both of us coming from the Catholic tradition, was that she, she was very true to quite orthodox Catholicism. I mean, although she believed that there could be women priests and so on, she still had great problems around uh, things like um, the issue of abortion, um, although she didn't publicly take stances on it. But she also had, you know, I remember having discussions with her about IVF and all sorts of things, and she got her knickers in the twist about all of that. <laughs> I mean, she really did. I, th <laughs> uh, I think, Helena, it was, it was I, I mean, I agree with you, but I think, as you say, it did come from her Catholicism, but at the same time, she saw those, she was intensely private about those things. She saw yeah. those things as as private issues, and obviously there were occasions where she had to vote in Parliament, usually on a free vote, so mm -hmm. people were, were mm -hmm. able to vote on abortion and so on, in line with their own convictions. Mm -hmm. And I think for her, she had the sense of a, an, an internal private life which accorded with her private beliefs of family values and so on. And I think in that sense, she was quite out of tune with society that became much more open about those things. In some ways, she was quite old-fashioned about no, she, that. No, she, she really was, because and I remember that when she was writing her book, um, uh, Lenny Gooding, her publisher, um, at, who is at Virago, um, was um, uh, sort of prevailed upon me, and she said, you have to get Shirley to be more um, open willing, about those things. to be more willing to talk about, for example, her divorce from your dad, and the pain of that, I mean, it, which was very painful for her. It was. Uh, it it was and, and she didn't want to talk about it at all. Mm. And, uh, well, and she didn't want to write the autobiography. Well, she certainly, I mean, that's right. She, didn't <laughs> want to she had to be sat and down then, and, <laughs> and tied to the, the thing. That's right. But she certainly didn't in the, uh, to want to talk about mm. um, emotional things that were private. And, uh, and I was given the task of trying to persuade her that that was part and parcel of who she was and, and that people wanted to know because, because for women in politics, you know, you, you were pursued around certain things. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, and she went through the business where she, um, uh, you know, she wanted an annulment and the, ch the church was pretty... Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, dreadful. problematic. Dreadful. We read that we, we th Rebecca read some of the letters and no, some, we threw some awful. This well, old no, bishop. Letters in the archive actually I from mean, Bishop saying, well, you know, we've considered your case and we are opining yeah. on it and actually we she think was, no. I mean, she, was, she was with a very lovely man um, whom she would have in other circumstances have married and, uh, and the Catholic Church was, was being impossible. And then eventually when she, um, and, and she ended up sacrificing that relationship because um, of the church. And then eventually, um, I mean, you know, 
that that whole business when she, when she then met Dick and Dick uh, uh, had proposed to her, going back to the church and the church said to her, somebody in the church said to her, um, "How old are you now?" And your mother was like, "I can't remember how old was you." Fifties. 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 And he said, "Well, you're not, you know, um, you won't be having children, and it's more of a companionship, really." <laughs> and she sort of. So that was okay. <laughs> and, and, and so they said, so that would be fine that they could have a blessing or some damn thing. But I think to go back to the, to the point about her personal life and why she didn't want to talk about it, I mean, I think, yes, we, we've said she's very private, but also I think because there was a lot of press interest, and I remember this as a child, hmm. um, around her divorce, and you might remember at that time in, you know, late 60s, early 70s, divorce wasn't as common as it is now. Um, and it wasn't something that people talked about as openly as they do now. Mm. And I think for her, it was something she didn't want and she didn't want the attention. Mm. And so I think her, her way of dealing with that really was to say, I'm not, you know, this is not going to be something that is open for discussion. And you're right, she didn't really want to go into it in her autobiography. Interestingly, her biographer, writes a biography much more about her public life than about her private life. And I suspect that's because she didn't actually give him very much information no, she, about she, it. She, and her friends probably didn't oh, know that she didn't want... He found quite a lot. He found quite a lot, but it didn't... It wasn't something she opened up about. He no, I mean... I didn't I, want to. She and I did have conversations about her, about all of that, because I had gone through a similar thing before I met Ian, my husband. Um, it, but as a friend, she, know, would. she and, would. And, she, and with friends, she could, she could yes, talk about those absolutely. things and about how they were, the, the pain of loss and so on. And I think um, could be quite honest about that. I yeah. Mean, quite open about it. But she, but she, but she, uh, she definitely had that distinction about what was private was mm. hers and she was not going to lay, lay on the table. And, uh, you know, she really felt that it was intrusive for it to be yeah. expected but of her. I, I wanted to, to ask all of you really about her feminism because you, you say she's a feminist, but in a way to me, she always seemed, her feminism, feminism seemed to be under the radar to some extent mm. because like a lot of distinguished women um, throughout history, throughout modern history, um, she never realized that she was um, you know, so special and so gifted that other women couldn't necessarily follow her. Um, but I think, Mark, she was very unusual in that she, for, you know, for the time in which she grew up, she was very unusual in having a mother that was the that, breadwinner who yeah. had yes. the main career, that both her parents had equal career. And as you say, if anything, her mother you know, was, was, the, was the breadwinner and she was, you know, the way she was brought up was that she told she didn't interrupt her mother's work. Her mother was quite distant, you know, in a way the child rearing was a little delegated and that wasn't just a function of, of having money and having other people to do it. It was a function of her mother actually feeling there was something more important in her life um, and that children were sort of a little bit incidental to that, certainly when they were little. And I think that message was perhaps very unusual in that day and age. And um, so I think you're right, there was a sort of feminism under the radar because it was what she experienced rather than something right. she took on as an ideology. But it was I, I thought normal. Right. It was normal for her. Yeah. Yes, but, but I think one should emphasise that when Shirley entered Parliament in 1964, she was one of only 29 yeah. women MPs. Yeah. She was the only the seventh woman cabinet minister. I mean, you can go through them, Margaret Bonfield, mm. Ellen Wilkinson, mm. Barbara Carlson, Margaret Thatcher just before her. Um, and when it came to Callaghan's cabinet between 76 and 79, she was the only woman in the cabinet. And at the same time, she was a single mother. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that was a very lonely time for her. Um, and I think, you know, there were beginning to be... She was on the NEC of the Labour Party, and at that time there was a lot of infighting. Mm -hmm. and so you've seen the letters. There were, she yeah, she there writes were letters. letters to Tony King about how dreadful the NEC was when she was... Oh, and, she and left she, in nineteen. Well, I remember, actually, as a teenager, she used to absolutely dread going to those meetings and she would come back white as a sheep because they were very mm. personal, they were very unpleasant. And, you know, there was complete internecine yeah. warfare, really. And I think for her, that, that wasn't how she related to politics, you know. It was much no. more on a personal level. And I think she found this all very disorienting and, and didn't have that support. And she did write in, in her book about not having that support at that time. But she also writes that men 
in politics overestimate, overestimate themselves while women underestimate themselves. I think that's true. But okay. you look at the latest <laughs> education <laughs> secretary, Gillian Keegan, and she's not, can't be accused of being guilty of um, But these are different times, Mark. Yourself. I mean, you know, these are different times, aren't they? Because yeah. we, we don't expect no, from no, politicians what we did then. Perhaps, you know, more's the pity. Um, and but there was that moment, I mean, it, it, and, I've, and I remember discussing it with her, was that when uh, David Owen tried to encourage her to stand, mm. um, at, because when they were creating the, um, the Social Democratic Party, yeah. they, 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 uh, there was uh, the question of who should lead. And there were the four contenders, really, in a way, or the four people who were obviously, um, you know, sort of, contenders and uh, and uh, she didn't she I mean Owen wanted her to put herself forward and she kind of backed off and um, I just it was and she said well because I just felt I had that female reticence of thinking of not wanting to be the pushy woman you know uh, I, mean, I think there's there's a lot of questions isn't there you know a lot of questions were, were asked at one time about you know why why didn't she become the the, the first woman Prime Minister, or you know, yeah. why did she not become leader of, of the um, of the SDP, and so on? Um, why did she not put herself forward as a candidate for Warrington, which she would have won yeah. almost certainly as the first to be the first mm -hmm. SDP MP, and it was narrowly lost by Roy Jenkins, who wasn't really the right candidate, probably there. But and and you know, these questions have often been raised, and and different answers suggested, and I think there is some truth in that. She wasn't essentially ruthless, and perhaps no, you had to have a streak. Like she wanted people to like her. And one thing that has been said, and I think this is very interesting because I think it comes quite a lot from, is infused by her Catholicism, which is that she saw politics, she said, I, I'm in politics to serve. Yeah. And if you serve the people in politics, you are not really necessarily leadership material. You are not putting yourself forward enough. I but, think there was an element but of But she, she didn't want to be... I mean, in the years she was touted as the possible first woman prime minister, she really didn't want to be a prime minister anyway because she relished other things about her life and she loved, she loved freedom. Um, we once went on... We were meant to be going to a political meeting and she stopped the car and we went on a, a muddy walk. Well, and so when she arrived at the meeting, her shoes yes. were covered in mud, and she said, you can see why I could never have been prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And there, there was the famous time when... Uh, I mean, she was very good, even when she was in her later years. She would, she would take my children for sort of off for weekends in the New Forest, where she'd spent time, some time growing up as a child. She loved the New Forest. And she went to see friends who still lived there, and she'd take my children, and, and you know, I was always rather surprised that that they came back. Alive. Yeah. <laughs> Not least because her driving was absolutely appalling. Um, but one time I was due to meet her in London when she was going to deliver the children back and we, we were going on. I was taking the children somewhere else afterwards and they came back and my son, elder son came out of the car not wearing any shoes. So I said, well, where are his shoes? And she said, well, I'm afraid they're in a box somewhere in the New Forest because they'd gone on one of these wild walks and she slightly <laughs> underestimated the conditions. And you, know, you got used to that sort of thing. But um, Mark's right. She liked to have that, that freedom. But I think it's, it's an interesting question still about why she didn't put herself forward perhaps for leader of the um, SDP or as a candidate in Warrington, because she, in some ways, was the best asset the party had. And she held back. And I, you know, that, I think, is a very interesting question. But, as, she, as but, she she was, but she was indecisive. I mean, she, one of the, her virtues as a politician was she could see all sides of the argument often. But then um, get mired in it. And then get some, mired yeah, in the detail. To some extent. And the other thing I think is so interesting about her as a politician is that the reason, part of the reason why she appealed to the public in the 60s and 70s was that she, she didn't always follow the party line. So most famously over Europe, I mean, she was sitting next to Harold Wilson at a press conference and suddenly announced that she would resign if the referendum on Europe went against um, her position, which was obviously pro-Europe. And Wilson, quite reasonably, um, tore a strip off uh, later. But she did this on a number of occasions on, with Ugandan Asians. Um, she was so defied a three-line whip. Defied a three-line whip. So she, she often... But I think that was, a, again, comes back to her principles. Because yes. I think they were, absolutely, they were always going to be the most but important you, But you can see how, her. as a party... And also, I think, another thing that played its part was people liked her, other politicians liked her, 
but they grew very envious of her. And uh, I think Roy Hattersley always behaved quite badly towards her last Because night. of her popularity? Yeah. He, he, um, was that any worse because she was a woman? Yes, or? I'm sure. sure. Um, she wasn't collegial. I mean, it's often said she, she didn't have many friends among MPs, really, did she? But I think that was very difficult to come into that yes, very male environment. Exactly. And I but think, you, all, know, the, you forget how different there's it all, is. There's also a thing that operates which is about um, party loyalty. Um, uh, you, you know, they, they, they take a stick to you, if, if, uh, which is about loyalty. Yeah. Where's your loyalty? And, um, and I always felt that, um, particularly around Shirley, because towards... Um, there came a point, I'm afraid, where uh, in the coalition government where I was... Um, she, was she was taking a very, very courageous stance in relation to health reforms. You'll remember this, Rebecca. Very and she took uh, it was it, and she was taking a very strong stance to say that what they were doing to health um, was wrong, and uh, and she was being really brave, making wonderful speeches in the House of Lords, and uh, and it was out of kilter with what the coalition were trying to do, and um, uh, she was really being incredibly brave about it all, and um, in the end she backed down and and she and I had words about it because I and well anyway I wanted her to sort of I said look you're you're now in your 80s you can you can you know who cares about the party and all that sort of thing and she didn't she, Hattersley and people like that had accused her of disloyalty and so loyalty the idea of disloyalty you know, sat hard on her shoulders. And Paddy um, really leaned very hard on her mm. to say, we can't in coalition. Um, uh, but do you think she was seduced by Nick Clegg, who she seemed to look up to in a rather extraordinary way? I, I felt that it was through Paddy. I, th right. I felt that Paddy was the person she who leaned on her. She had great respect for Paddy. She did, and Paddy leaned on her and said, "This, you know, we've, we've we, you know, we've always, we've never had a chance of being in any way in government and so on. And sometimes you just have to swallow pills that you don't like." And um, and and she found it really, really hard. And um, it did her a lot of damage. It did her a lot of damage at the time. And and I love, I loved her so much. I wa and I wanted her just to say. I'm sorry. I'm. I'm. St this is. This is too important to me. Um, and I said, look, you, you know, you're you, you're you're past the stage of having to think about those things. And um, and she and she felt that she had to be loyal to the to I the, think that to loyalty the party. came partly out of you know it was experience. A, it was a party that that you know, or part of a party that she had herself created. Yeah. So I think you know it yeah. was. I remember there were certain you know senior members of New Labour, particular Peter Mandelson because of the Herbert Morrison. The Herbert Morrison thing. She used to say to Peter, her back and she I was closer to your grandfather probably than you were. And it was probably true. Yeah. So I mean I think he he said, you know, it's it's all different now, come back. And she said, no, you know, I've made my decision, I've made my choice. Mm. And this is yeah. where I am. No, no, no. Lots of efforts were made to get her to come back. Yeah. So we're talking about um, some of the challenges and some of the things perhaps she didn't do. She's associated with so many Issues that are so resonant now. I mean, cost of living and What's Europe happened and the health service. Exactly. What 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 are the things she was really proud of politically? Do you think? Comprehensive schools. Comprehensive schools. She, she was, was the mother actually. of that. I mean, I mean, um, that was her thing. I mean, I, I, you know, this comes up a lot because people always associate her with that. Um, and it wasn't a policy that she actually introduced. It was introduced by Tony Crossland in the first Wilson government, but as Education Secretary, obviously she was tasked with, with implementing yeah. it. And it was certainly something she it totally accorded with her principles and her belief in equality of opportunity. And she felt very strongly, again, it was her, her feeling that you shouldn't necessarily be privileged at a very young age and, and have advantages that others were not, were excluded from. Um, and I think she, you know, she had experience of, of state education herself, rather against her parents' wishes, I think. She'd taken herself <laughs> off to, to a state primary school and indeed a secondary school in the New Forest during the war. And I think, um, you know, that was, that was something she was actually proud as a lasting legacy. Mm -hmm. She felt it was, the, it was you know, that separating children at a young mm -hmm. age 
was what, what nailed down the class system. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And she and and you know she was very clear about class in in her politics that she felt that it was such a destructive way part of British society, and she felt that education was one of the things where you could make that change. There's a very touching letter. I think it's the last exhibit in the exhibition upstairs from a, a young girl who, um, mm. in 2016, who was had been at a comprehensive school, and she wrote Shirley saying how much she loved her school and how she got a place at university. And, and Shirley's point was that, of course, middle-class parents talked about the destruction of the grammar schools, but what they never talked about was what happened to um, people, who, children who were forced to go to secondary moderns um, at the age of 11 and, and what their fate was. Many more children than yes, the right. ones that went to grammar school. And I think the other aspect, really, it's perhaps sometimes overlooked when people, people look at you know, her, her being a, a Labour cabinet minister and, and co-founder of the SDP is that she had, she was very internationalist in her outlook. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mean, her, her father was uh, was an academic in America and she spent time in America as a child so that she had, was was very comfortable both in America and in, in Britain and obviously worked in America herself after she lost her, her seat, SDP seat, and before she went to the House of Lords, she was at the... Um, uh, Kennedy School of Government at, at Harvard University. But part of the work she did there, actually, was called... She was director of something called Project Liberty, which um, was involved with the dem democratisation of emerging uh, Central and Eastern European countries in the um, early 90s, including drafting the, um, the constitution for Ukraine. And, and she would indeed have been absolutely horrified by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But in a way, I think she would have understood that because she understood that Russia felt would feel very threatened by the expansion of, of the EU and NATO near its borders. Uh, but she was consistent, consistently pro-European, pro-the EU. And her valedictory speech in the House of Lords in 2016 was just before, a few months before the referendum. And, and she was aware it was going to be a very close call. And and Helena probably remembers this, but she warned of, of Britain outside Europe in saying that Britain would struggle to, to conceive of its role in the world. And I think that was very prescient, actually. No, oh, it was. It and, was. and she knew, she knew she what knew, the yeah. problems would be. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, she, I mean, on that business of her being a great internationalist, she was a wonderful person to talk about anywhere in the world. She, she almost always knew something about it. I went to India with her. I went to Brazil yes. with her. Um, we, we, uh, and we, I loved traveling with her because she was, you know, she really knew what was going on politically and she was so um, always on top of... Uh, and it was part of wanting to, you know, meet people from everywhere, from all walks of life, yeah. all parts of the world, you know, yeah. that... That really engaged her. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. She'd come back from these various places. I mean, I remember in her old age, in her late 80s, you know, she said to me, oh, I'm, I'm going to India next week. And I was terribly cross because I thought she really wasn't able to go on her own. You know, she was a bit... Uh, frail. Um, frail with her walking and so on. And she said, oh, no, 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 I, I have to go. And she was very involved with a voluntary organisation there called Seven Mandir based in uh, Rajasthan. And she'd gone to see their projects and so on. So she took herself off and I had to organise for her to sort of get through the airport, and which she, had, of course, hadn't thought of because that was far too many <laughs> And she didn't like getting details. in a wheelchair. Oh, no, she absolutely refused that. So I had to organise discreet help behind the scenes. But, you know, she firmly went off and came back absolutely full <coughs> of stories. What a wonderful time. She planted trees, you know, she'd done this, she'd done that. And, you know, it was hugely energising for her, I think, even in later life, to be able to do these things, to, to meet people, to see different places and, and so yeah, on. Yeah, she was amazing. So that, I think, that energy for life, that zest for life, which continued right to the end, was extraordinary. I mean, it, I found it exhausting. <laughs> I, I, I also want to tell you that um, uh, Dick Newstadt, um, who is her, her, you know, her second husband, he, I remember uh, having a meal with him. She hadn't arrived on the Cape. She'd gone off to some conference. And he and I uh, had dinner together on our own. And, uh, and he told me about how when his wife, Bert, was very ill. And his she first was, wife. Yeah, his yeah. first wife. And, uh, and uh, she was very close to Shirley, and they were great friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she was dying, she apparently said to Bert, to, to Bert said to, to, Dick, uh, yeah. to, Dick, to, to Dick, um, you know, you're a man who really thrive in a marriage. They've been together, married forever and a day since they were very, very young. And she said, and if you're going to think about marrying, 
you know, uh, uh, the person you should marry is Shirley. And he said, he'd always seen Shirley as his intellectual adversary. They'd always had spats and discussions and, you know, all of that. And as a, but he said, he never in his life sort of thought, and, and he thought, what is she talking about? She must be mad. And then afterwards he said, when he was sort of recovering from grief and so on, and three years later, having been pursued by many women, he then Which came to London and fell in love with Shirley. But I mean, as a, as a follow-up to that, um, actually, Helena, what's that, that's all absolutely right. But what's very funny is that friends of his said to him, well, you know, who had met Shirley, obviously, through the Kennedy School and so on, said, well... Um, you know, Shirley's a wonderful person, but she is younger than you and she's hugely energetic. You know, won't you find that terribly tiring? Because Dick was sort of nearing 70 at this time. And he said, yeah, he said, I will, but what a way to go. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was wonderful. That was great. And, you know, great. fantastic. Um, I could keep listening to this for ages. But coming back to the archive, um, now you said that she, she very much wanted it to come here. Yes. But wondering how she imagined it it would be used and, and how do you imagine it would be used what, what would you like to see from it well I think she imagined it as um, a resource really for, for students of, of modern um, politics really and about um, I think she understood that the formation of the STP although it didn't um, ultimately break really the two-party mold of British politics which we still have I think she understood it was a very significant period in politics and a re painful reforming of the Labour Party and, and have, as many have said, you know, paved the way for the Blair governments and the, of the more centre ground and new Labour. So I think she understood that would be of interest and there is a huge amount of material in the archive about the formation of the SDP and about drafts of constitutions of the SDP and all of that I think will be very interesting to, to researchers of that of that period. Um, but I think it will be broader than that. I think the, the international aspect which we've talked about, and in particular the work of Project Liberty, where well, there's quite a lot of material on that, about the period post the breakup of the Soviet Union and the emergence of um, Eastern European countries and how they have contributed to the enlargement of the EU. I think all of that is also um, there for people who are interested in it. I think, as Mark has said, um, the feminist angle, although she didn't necessarily write a lot herself about <coughs> feminism as such, I think her behaviour and her, in a very male world is of interest, and the fact that she was the only uh, woman in the Callaghan government and one of, of two in the Wilson cabinet, that is strange from a modern perspective already, um, so that will be interesting. And I think also for people interested in, in religion and, and her faith, which, as we've discussed, I think did influence hugely her principles, the way she lived her life, and, you know, her approach to politics as well, actually. So I think all of those factors are, are interwoven in, in quite an interesting way. There's so much, I mean, Helena, I'm interested yes, in terms that. of... Um of women MPs now. I mean, we, a lot has improved. We see far more women in Parliament. We've had three prime ministers, female prime ministers, just about. Mm, um, <laughs> but um, look at the abuse and the misogyny, and it's really tough for a woman MP. And um, you know, wh why is that still so hard, I suppose, mm. to have many decades on? And what, what could they take or not take from Shirley? Well, that really, you know, I mean, um, what is misogyny about if it's not about power? It's about the absence of power. It's about male entitlement and and uh, a sense of the primacy of the male. And and so that still lives on, unfortunately. And so the, the now, of course, with the uh, uh, with social media, there's got a megaphone for some of the uglier things that feel people feel disinhibited about what they say. And that, that disinhibition that started online now it exists even even in the public square so you know I, I i do think that women are subjected to it really i mean i think all politicians get a lot of ghastly stuff but i think that women are particularly subjected to to the vile um and it's not just directed to them it's directed to their threats to their children all sorts of things so i mean uh, and it's all almost always laden with a sexual uh, overtone so it's <laughs> it's particularly horrible uh, and and they uh, you know i i i chaired an inquiry up in scotland which was about some of this stuff and it's really awful but um i i and i don't i mean i 
I don't know what, I mean, a lot of that, it's hard to believe it really, that Shirley has missed some of the more recent things. Yeah. And I often wonder about, I, I listened last night to, um, Ian found um, something that she gave us, which was her Private Passions, where she was on mm. uh, uh, um, the radio of Private Passions, where she'd chosen pieces of music. It was so lovely hearing her voice again. She had an exquisite voice. She had the most beautiful, beautiful uh, voice. And hearing her talking about music, I mean, she, it was just wonderful. Um, but her, um, when she stood up to make speeches in the House of Lords, um, you know, you could hear a pin drop. She had that ability to really be quite lyrical in when talking about um, politics. And she brought a sort of moral force when she was talking about, about things, um, you know, that where she saw the bigger picture. I mean, it was just always wonderful listening to her. And that's maybe that's something that's lacking a bit today, is well, it? We've lost some of that lyricism of great oratory. You know, we've, we've lost some of that. But do you think she also would have been effective in, in putting forward a government, I don't know whether a post like this exists in a modern government, that talking to the public about what the government is trying to do. Well, it, well there's so much dishonesty just mm. now. There's all this business about spin, spin doctors and all of that. I mean, she would have hated that. She would have hated she that. Was, she was very frank about what she felt and thought. She really was. But if she believed in the policy, I mean, she could explain it and put it across like yeah. nobody else could. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just wanted to ask something about why you think during that period, I mean, there must be very obvious reasons. During the 60s and 70s, you had these three remarkable women vying for the top positions. You have um, Castle, you have Thatcher, and you have Williams. What was it that, I mean, they were so remarkable, they had to, they, they had to push very hard, they had the... Well, the 60s was a very interesting period. You've got to remember the wider context of it. There was there were the whole, if, you know, in the United States, you had the civil rights movement going on. Um, you had a sort of, you know, sense of liberation and freedom. It was the end of, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on about the end yeah. of, of co colonization and so on. Um, you know, I mean, I mean that business of of the um, the movement, the civil rights movement in the United States. I mean, I think gave rise to the women's movement, gave rise to what happened in Northern Ireland over the civil rights movement there, and then the sort of beliefs of why should we be treated as second class citizens, and that those those things were happening, and so opportunities were beginning to take place for women. It was the time when, you know, women started thinking, I mean, that, that opened up, un universities opened up for women then. I mean, yes, those of the privileged um, upper middle classes were got to university and, uh, and the few odd children of the grammar schools. But the real opening up of the universities happened towards the end of the 60s. So it was a moment of great change. But none of, none of those women really subscribed to this moment no, but, of great but, change. But, but when, when <gasps> things start opening up, then people start thinking differently. And right. there, were, there must have been, you know, uh, in, in his talking about the white hot heat of technology, Wilson, he must have thought, you know, it's important that we have sort of, you know, other, you know it doesn't all look like a crowd of men in suits, you know? Yeah. Don't you think? Yes. But I mean, yes. But I think, you know, I, I think in terms of talking about, um, you know, explaining policies and so on. I don't think the system really allows for it in the same way now. You know, you have, no, you have short sound it bites. Should. I know, but politicians Can't are not are trained to to <laughs> approach the public in a completely different way and, yes, and a my much goodness, more listen to superficial way. Sunak's yes, sort of and I think a lot of it is unrecognisable from the time that my well, mother I think it's a great politics. Loss. Indeed, but you know, you, you have to recognise how much, if you like technology and the approach of, of politicians to the public, I think, has, has changed hugely. But if you, if she had, would not have, Shirley would not have liked that at all. No, but if there had been greater clarity in, in public meetings and in politicians speaking during the, um, the Europe vote in, in 2000 and oh, well. whenever it was, 16, 16, then things might have been a Indeed, bit different. but, you know, we are No, but we, we, are. We, we know <laughs> that there were bots and bot farms and people were having their emails filled or in their, and their social media filled yeah. with, with rubbish and people were being lied to and uh, all of that. I mean, we know that. No. But I think, I think the thing about Shirley was that, in a way, you know, you've talked about the skill, the skill she had speaking. I mean, I think what she, what she had was just a natural talent for, for being very open, for being very accessible, for being able to reach people. And that is something I don't think you can teach. I think, you no. know, you have that or you don't have that. And I th but I think that it's very difficult to give, you know, to most politicians, you can't quite work out what their political legacy is, certainly not 
in the short term. But I think one of the great things about this archive is it, it sort of it shows the workings of, of a different kind of yeah, politician. And, absolutely. Uh, no, that's, absolutely. And that's just what I was going to say, that yeah, in, in this be... era of emails and tweets, yeah. we're not going to have that kind of record. No. And this is what's fantastic about the arc. You can see the notes, the inner workings, the thinking yes, behind it. won't it. happen in the same way, I don't um, think. Which it makes it very special. In that way. I am going to jump in at this point, uh -huh. because I feel like we ought to take some questions yeah, that'd be great. Um, from the audience, because we'll just keep chatting otherwise. Uh, and I'm yeah. sure there's so much that's come out here that um, it'd be lovely to, to ask you um, what we haven't answered yet and the rest of it um no, i'm hoping there's is there a microphone brilliant right um stick your hands up i would love to <coughs> hear from a woman first because <laughs> we've been talking about women so uh, i'd love to have a, a first question for from a woman i'm being blinded so i can't see lovely right next to you just just behind you just there. thank you um i was wondering if you thought that in order to become a successful woman in politics, you have to kind of sacrifice some of your personal beliefs. Like, do you have to become less feminine or less feminist, at least be more conservative in order to be successful nowadays? Thank you very much. Helena, I'm going to put that to you. <coughs> I don't think so. I mean, I, I mean you only have to see uh, the, the, the there are incredible women in Parliament, mm -hmm. and, and that's in all the parties, who are happy to say that they're feminists, who are, are very clear about... Uh, uh, about their their sense of their own femaleness. Um, no, I don't think that they feel that they... I mean, that's not to say that, you know, I like the politics of, every, of all, all the women that are around. Um, um, you know, if somehow the Home Office seems to bring out the worst <laughs> in people. Yes. <laughs> but uh, but so all that. I can say to you is that, no, I think that there are really terrific women. I mean, um, there are certainly are in the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats and the Greens and amongst the Conservatives. I mean, in the House of Lords, there are women that, um, are, you know, are really terrific on women's issues, for example. And no, I don't think, I really don't think so. You don't have to do it like the guys anymore, happily. Any thoughts to add to that? I think, uh, I mean, I'm glad to hear you say that, Helena. I, I suspect that, that that was a bit different. I think certainly oh, was, Margaret yeah. Thatcher very much modelled herself as, as a woman in a very male world. I think she didn't appeal particularly to, to women often. Um, I think she styled herself in, in quite a masculine way. And I think she saw that at that time. Um, obviously, she had particular political gifts, but she saw at that time as that was what you had to do, I think. Yeah, I mean, to be I mean cut to the top. if power is seen in a male form, then it's not surprising that people mm. learn how to play that game and to do it in that way. And I think increasingly women are sort of saying, no, I'm not going to do it like that. And I, and I think that's generally a move that's been taking place. And it'll be fine when you come along. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, other questions? Uh, over here. Thank you. I'm really sorry. Would you mind just waiting for the microphone? Because um, we have people listening online, so make sure that they pick it up. Just give us one second. Yes. Right. If you wouldn't mind starting from yes. the beginning. Thank you. Uh, yes, this, this is a question uh, for Rebecca. I had the privilege of very briefly meeting her mother uh, in the 50s when I was a, a teenager, going to my first uh, Fabian summer school in Lampeter in, uh, in Wales. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't come from a political family uh, particularly, but I was impressed by t two aspects of your mother. You know, firstly, she seemed sort of classless uh, because I was used to either being with middle class people who tended to be a bit Tory or w working class people. Because I, I was brought up in Warrington, which has been mentioned several times uh, today where one was very aware, aware of working class people too. And I felt your mother didn't uh, sort of fit in either, although obviously she was educated and therefore middle class, but not in middle class values, if you like. And the other fact was that she seemed so youthful uh, and normal, uh, normal in the sense uh, she was very bright, but not, not snobbish and Fun. talking down to people. Yeah. Uh, to what extent do you put th that to the geography of where she was brought up? In other words, coming from being brought up in Buxton in her early childhood, if I understand that she was brought up um, there, and then later in America, mm -hmm. if she was uh, a, a refugee for a period, 
to what extent did her childhood being in Buxton and, and America, North America affect her personality? Because the, obviously your family is a different dimension and I, I can't uh, ask about that too much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my mother wasn't actually brought up in Buxton. It was her mother who grew up in Buxton and, and wrote about that in, in Testament of Youth. Um, my mother visited Buxton many times, but, but certainly didn't live there. Um, she grew up in, in London um, at, at the point at which she was born. Her, her mother and father lived in, in Chelsea. And I think, as we've mentioned in, in passing, I think that in some way she had quite a a privileged upbringing. Her mother was, was fairly wealthy after writing Testament of Youth when my mother was a young child. Um, and in, in some ways, you're right, uh, she, she saw that privilege as in some ways a bit of a burden. I mean, she certainly wanted to, to feel classless. She didn't feel that she was superior to other people. I think this harks back to what we've said about her having a great rapport with everybody whatever class they were from, whatever background. She genuinely liked people and was interested in people. So I think that um, in that respect, you're right. And I think there was another part of the question which I've forgotten. Um, the States as well. That, that international... Um, Did America affect up. her? Yes, and I think um, she, you're right. She, she went to America as, as a child. She was evacuated there uh, during the war because her, her parents, uh, due to their political activities, felt it would be unsafe for her to remain in, in Britain at a time when there was a threat of an invasion of Britain. And um, I think that made her very self-reliant. Uh, she had gone at a young age and, and led a, a, you know, a very independent life out there with people, with uh, foster parents that she had not met before she went out there. So I think that was formative indeed, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Another question uh, here, if you wouldn't mind waiting for the microphone as well. Thank you. Um, I was very um, touched at the beginning when you were talking about Shirley's kindness. Um, and um, uh, how often do we read in obituaries uh, that somebody was very, very kind, but they didn't suffer fools kindly? Uh, was that true of your mother? Um, that's an interesting question. She was genuinely very kind and actually very non-judgmental. And I think one of the things she said in her autobiography was that one of the, the differences between my parents, which I think was one of the few things they, they argued about, was that my father was quite judgmental and did not suffer fools at all gladly. Um, and was a very, a very bright academic who, who found rather slow people intolerable. My mother, <laughs> I think genuinely had um, a great deal of Christian charity. I mean, that's really the only way you could describe it. And, and, you know, she embraced people, you know, whatever they're like, wherever they came from. I remember being intensely embarrassed as a, as a young teenager walking through London. I think we were going to the festival hall or something for a concert. And we were crossing the bridge, and um, Charing Cross Bridge, and my, my mother saw a, a tramp asleep. And um, she said, oh, he looks terribly cold. And I said, well, you know, he's asleep. Can't we just walk past? And, and she said, no. And she took out 20 pounds. He had a hat on. And she lifted up his hat, put the 20 pounds under the hat, and put that. And I said, but he might never find it. And, and she said, well, I'm going to believe that he will, you know, and that will make a difference. And, you know, it's, it's a small thing. But in a way, it, it's, it said quite a lot about her, you know, that she actually thought about everyone. And, and in that sense, she was very non-judgmental, actually. Interesting. Um, can I remind anybody watching online that, of course, um, you can submit questions as well? We had anybody f from anybody online? No, no. no. Um, other questions on the floor? Down here. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, so obviously, Shirley had a huge amount of confidence to kind of put herself forward in the way that she did and, you know, get involved in all of the, the, the issues she got involved in. I just wondered, did she ever kind of have those moments where her confidence was shaken and, and how did she recover from I, I remember places? one very clearly. Um, in 2003, I think, or 2002 possibly, Roy Jenkins died and Tony Blair was meant to give um, his, uh, the, the address at the memorial service for him in Westminster Abbey. But because Tony Blair was sort of flying out to Camp David for his love-in with George Bush, <laughs> um, 
he wasn't available, and so Shirley was chosen to do it. And I have never seen her so nervous. I mean, she was mm. very elegantly dressed, had had her hair done very smartly, and was wearing dark blue, but she was shaking, and it really was an ordeal for her. I, th I think she... I went to that memorial service uh, um, through Shirley's good agencies, and we were sat in the choir, and opposite me were, was Thatcher and Heath, and, and in between them was a man. And I said to, to the verger, what is that man doing there? And he said, he sits between Thatcher and Heath on all official <laughs> um, But anyway, I, um, I think Shirley knew she was, was speaking to the whole political establishment. And I was really surprised at how nervous she was, but sorry. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? I, I didn't know that story, but I think that it, it picks up a bit of what we, we said earlier about, um, you know, at, at some level, her not feeling comfortable with a leadership role and in the sense of representing yeah. Roy in that way. I mean, she always found Roy slightly intimidating, yeah. I think. Um, I mean, he was a minor son. I don't know why she felt yeah. quite so overshadowed by him, but I, he was rather grand. He was. And I think it wasn't her style, and I think she didn't quite know how to deal with it. And I remember a couple of times we went to, uh, when I was quite a young child, we went to, before the SDP days, we went to a Sunday lunch at his country home in East Hendred. And they were terribly long, leisurely affairs with lots of wine. I was bored out of my mind. But I remember my mother took these very seriously and made a great effort to get dressed up and things, which she never normally did. And I always thought that was rather surprising. It was rather strange. It was rather strange. And so I think, I think it's an interesting question because I think that fundamentally she was confident. And I think a lot of that came from her father. Her father was hugely supportive of her and proud of her from a young age and in a way... You know, perhaps it's quite a stereotypical thing that she had managed to achieve the things that he wanted and hadn't managed to achieve himself in being elected to Parliament. And, uh, you know, he was always writing her extremely long letters, which were almost indecipherable. His writing was appalling. There might be some examples of that in the archive, actually. But, you know, I mean, he... he constantly heaping praise on, you know, I, I heard you in Parliament, it was absolutely wonderful, you know, hugely, hugely supportive. And I think she got a lot of confidence from that. But, you know, as we discussed, there were some strange limitations to that, which I think are interesting. We've gone through this whole evening and not, none of us have mentioned her lateness. She was <laughs> absolutely <laughs> incapable. That got better with Dick. She got better when she got married. Well, she got, when, when she Dick got, wasn't when, having any of that. Was, but, she was, but she was impossible. And it, well, she reverted when he died. <laughs> I mean, she really was not capable of but getting... You know it was optimism. That, it was but optimism. you know what that was? It was because... And I, mean, I saw it time and again, because often I was waiting for her to take me to something, and it never happened. But, you know, she would get talking to somebody, and somebody would say, oh, I'd just like to ask you a question about... And, and she would never say, as, as normal people would say, well, actually, I have to go. I'm supposed to be here, and that's all but very when interesting, you but now your, I have to go. When you were in your 20s, you kept your watch half an hour far. Yes. And you caught her <laughs> lateness, because you were never on time. Well, so I suppose you just gave up. Well, I suppose I'd just <laughs> grown up with that example. What could I do? What could I do? I'm better now. She got a bit better, but as you say, not for long. But I suppose, going back to that question, and that, that, did you ever see moments of self-doubt? Did you, see, when you were in Cape Cod, did you see that sort of other side? Oh, no, she, no, no, not, not at all. I mean, I mean, you know, she would take on, try anything, take on anything. No, she was always... Well, she was fearless. On she a was physical fearless. Physically, point. she Absolutely. was fearless. I mean, Absolutely. terrifying. But you haven't mentioned her terrifying. temper. Um, she had the most... Oh, I mean, I only saw it twice, but she had the most volcanic... Um, temper when but very rarely very very, very rarely, rarely. Never but it was no, truly yeah. frightening really she once Mark she never once recovered. was i was working for her and she her secretary said that i was responsible for not getting her plane tickets right so she marched back to the flat where i was sitting in front of her computer and absolutely screamed you know, the, the, the the flat down it was really frightening wasn't it? Oh. Yes, but that did happen very rarely. It did happen very rarely. But as a child, you know, Winifred Holbury always used to say, oh, God, Shirley's had these terrible tantrums today. And, um, she was I... a very strong-willed child, I think. Yeah, yeah. she was. A very very strong-willed, yeah. She could be. Yes. No, I, I, I only saw it when we were having the discussions about the, um, the, the national health reforms that the Conservatives really were pushing and which they'd managed to, per, to twist the arms of the, of, of the Liberal Democrats to accept. And she had held firm and had hoped to pull it in that direction and then hadn't been able to. And, uh, and I think that she was f feeling... It, it was very painful and it was when she... And when she and I were 
talking about that, it was clear that she was very torn and very full of mm. vacillation about it. I think it's very interesting the sort of um, kind of public private divide on this though actually because you know you've mentioned that and it has been said that sometimes she was indecisive in political life and oh, absolutely not in her private life I mean she'd tell us all what to do with that there was absolutely no question of considering alternatives or other things being on the table shall I tell them the story of, about going to Rome we went to Rome with her and Rebecca's husband um, then husband had to fly home early he was and working so in Malaysia he was working in Malaysia and Rebecca and I were both paying for very expensive hotel rooms. We were about 35 at this time. And we went to Shirley and said, um, we're going to share a room in order to... Well, we didn't to... go to Shirley, we just said... We said we're going to share, but she said, absolutely not. She said, that's completely inappropriate. So we said, well, we're just it's trying to save some money. They're a right. separate <laughs> beds, <laughs> you know. And, and she'd known Mark, you know, I'd known Mark since since I since we were 18. She'd known him for an awfully long time. It was very, but she was very Did odd. Did she win, or did you win that argument? No, we gave in to her. I, and I often say to Rebecca, There was no negotiation. We do, we do. No, there was no negotiation. Lovely. Thank you. I think we've probably got time for one more question. Is there one from online? Yes, Brilliant. Have a from online. Um, just put into microphone. Hi. We've got a question from online from uh, Rosemary, who has a. It's for you, Rebecca. She asks, uh, What would you regard as a gift or life lesson your mother gave you? A gift or a life lesson? Yes, that's an interesting question. Um, I think primarily. Actually, I mean, I'm very proud of her. I'm very proud of, of who she was and of the life she led. And it was fascinating to be part of that. I think really her legacy to me is, is how you treat people and, and treat everybody and that everybody has a value, really, I think. And that you don't prejudge people depending on where they were educated or how much money they have. And in fact, in some ways, I think she was more suspicious of people the more money they had. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, they, kind of, they almost had to win her round, in a sense, to, to show they were actually good people. And I think that's, that's a really important lesson because a lot of people are taken in by appearances, and I think that's even truer now, probably, than it was when I was growing up. Um, and I think, in some ways, she wouldn't like the modern world very much. Um, she would have found it quite superficial. Um, but I think that's, that's, that's a really important example, actually. Lovely. Um, thank you very much. Just um, before we go, just bring it back to, to the archive and mm. recommend that everybody goes to see it. And it's also one of the things, don't just come to the exhibition because it's going to continue being catalogued. It's one to keep yeah. coming back and investigating. But if, there, if there's one thing that you would like everyone to take away tonight um, about Shirley, about her legacy, um, about what we've talked about tonight, what would it be? And I'm, I'm going to start with Mark. <laughs> um, or it might be a gem from the archive or something about her. Well, I can have a story that sums up, um, I suppose, I don't know, it's a funny story. It's not a particularly flattering story, but um, <laughs> I was telling Sam and Nat, who are Shirley's god, god um, right. grandchildren, right. sorry, grandchildren, <laughs> Um, I loved it when you went travelling with Shirley and you played I either played Hunt the Train Ticket because she could never find it or there's this wonderful story of her at Bishop Stortford Station and she's, she was quite old then and she couldn't find her ticket as she was going through the barrier and the ticket collector said, oh, don't, don't worry. And they she said, knew her very well. They knew her very well and they said, don't worry, it, we'll, we'll, we'll trust you on that one. She said, no, no, I've got to find the ticket so I've got to find out where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that just, you know, in her 80s, she was still travelling all around the country. Couldn't be stopped. Couldn't Brilliant. be stopped. Brilliant. That's fantastic. Helena. Well, I, mean, I just think that she was a great egalitarian. She really wanted to uh, create a better world. I think she would be horrified at the idea that just now that we've got people who are, are you know, who have children that are going to bed hungry at night mm -hmm. and that, the, the, that we've got food banks everywhere. I mean, you know, the full horror of that, what's happening to the National Health Service, I think she'd be horrified by this because she believed in all of that and she believed that, uh, that we owed it to everyone to make um, those things good for them. And I think uh, that's been her inspiration to me. And let me tell you, I've been at, at, at events like this where it would be an audience of young women and they would all say, I want to be Shirley Williams when I grow up. <laughs> and they, that was what it was I like. You were one. <laughs> um, thank you. And uh, Rebecca? Yeah, and all that 
I agree with Helena absolutely, but I think I think I hope that the archive, when it is accessible to the public in 2025, whenever it is, will um, you know will be a really rich and informative um, source about her life. And I think the thing to remember is that it's it's a long life and a very diverse life with a huge range of interests. And I think all that is in there actually, um, you know, and it's it's fascinating in many ways. And and she herself said she'd had a wonderful life. Yeah, she had a wonderful life. Mm. Such a perfect place to end. Thank you so much. Um, three fantastic speakers here. And just to open up and hear from you.